Another routine landing is followed by another routine apron inspection. Engineers following a formal inspection routine carry this out on every arrival. It's all part of a culture that aims to ensure no items go unchecked. This car may not be as technically complex as an aircraft, but when it comes to inspections, the same disciplined approach applies when the car goes in for its MOT. Just like aircraft examinations, the MOT test is best carried out by following a formal inspection routine. This video is about getting into routines, because testers need them to get it right. Getting it right is important, because if you don't, the MOT test station might lose that. Procedure is very important. The procedure for the inspection is laid down in the tester's manual to assist the tester. It's important that he carries out this procedure so that he covers all aspects of the vehicle being tested, thus finding out any defects. Testers go wrong on two reasons. They fail vehicles incorrectly. This is because they don't refer to the manual for the correct standards and they fail to inspect the vehicle because they do not use the correct routine. Again, this routine is reproduced for them in the front of the manual and the inspectorate says that if you keep to the correct routine procedure, you will find all the defects that there are to be found. This video is not a replacement for the manual. The manual has all the details and standards required to either pass or fail a motor vehicle. The Vehicle Inspectorate is responsible for nearly 20,000 MOT stations across the country and it was at one of them I met technical trainer Henrik Kokoczynski. Hello Henrik. Hi Sean. Now what's the best advice you can give when you come to do a test and where do you start? Well let's start in reception. The process really starts here in reception where a few well chosen words by the receptionist can establish some factors that will certainly save time for the, testers late, for the tester later on. For example, is the vehicle the right class of vehicle to be tested at this test station? Is there a current and valid test certificate so that if necessary the, the certificate can be extended? Are the keys available that will unlock all of the apertures? Is it a diesel vehicle? Because if it is, there are two very specific questions that receptionists will have to ask about the service history of the vehicle and whether or not the vehicle was in any way laden, uh, which might inhibit a proper inspection of the car. And finally, personalised number plates. There again is a reason why you might need the logbook to establish the correct age of the vehicle. So what next? Well, let's move off to the parking area. What we're going to do now is called the pre-check, and that is simply to establish that the vehicle is in a fit condition to actually be tested. It will involve opening every aperture that's actually designed to be opened, such as the bonnet, a fuel cap, all the doors. And if, say, for example, it was a, a panel van, any side or slide sliding loading doors, the boot. When you open the boot, if it's full of luggage, you might have to refuse to test. Now, should we consider diesels here too? Yes, we do. Reception have already asked the two questions, firstly about the service history and about the cam belt. Well, it might seem obvious, Sean, but of course we've got to make sure that the vehicle will actually fit on the equipment and, quite importantly, that the bridge jack will actually lift it. Now, there are quite a number of other reasons why we might refuse to test a vehicle, such as too dirty, engine won't start, broken down. Now, these are listed in the introduction to the tester's manual. Pen and paper for this next part, Sean. It still is pen and paper at the moment. In the future, it's likely this sort of information gathering could be done electronically. So where do you get these forms from? Well, this particular form, the MOT inspection checklist, is sold by the vehicle inspectorate. But it's not a mandatory form. You may use any form that you wish. But ideally, whatever form you do use ought to be made out in duplicate. By the end of the inspection, this will become an inspection report containing all of the advisories as well as the failure items. 
One copy of it should then be attached to the customer's documents. And the second copy, most importantly, is retained by the test station. That could be particularly useful in the event of an appeal. Now the manual says start here in the driver's seat. So that of course is once we've done all the pre-checks and the information gathering. There are a lot of checks to be done from this seat and without a logical and flowing system you're very easily going to get lost. What I'm going to show you is a system that works well for me. It consists of checking the driver's seat security, doing all of the steering wheel checks, picking up on the horn and moving down the column to the stalks, operating all of the controls on the stalks. When I do the particular one that operates wash and wipe, I look up to assess the windscreen, the screen and glass, and bring in the mirrors at this time. Now the system I use for a dashboard involves starting at the left hand door pillar and sweeping progressively across the dashboard until we come to any testable item. Test that item now and sweep on to the next one. That will end us up on this post over here. When we've done that, we return to the column and move on down to the pedal group. Now it's so dark down there, I'll need a hand lamp later on. But what I will do now is the brake servo checks. And having completed the servo checks, I'd move across to the handbrake area here, carrying out all of the handbrake checks and the seat belt checks. And then finally, one last check before we get out of the vehicle, make sure that the passenger's inner door handle actually works. That's the, the inside of the car complete. When you get out of the vehicle, the manual has clear diagrams of the path to follow at ground level and underneath. This is a set routine and a route to follow as the tester works around the vehicle. The reason is simple. By doing so, the tester is more likely to be methodical and not miss any testable items. It's just like with the aircraft. The suggested routine in the manual, as we have seen, starts in the driver's seat with the associated checks. Next, get out and move around to the front of the vehicle to examine the lights and check headlight aim. Move back to the offside front, then work your way along checking the offside, not forgetting to open all the doors. Inspect all the sills for corrosion. In some cases, the outer ones might be easier to inspect later when you do the underside. At the rear, examine the lights and then inside the boot or cargo area. Then move forward down the near side to the front again, repeating the necessary checks. Finally, inspect under the bonnet. Now let's look at the routine in more detail. We've finished in a driver's seat and the next thing we're going to need is an assistant. Uh, a few words about the assistant. He's going to have to operate all the controls when I ask him. Now, even if he's a fully qualified tester himself, he cannot make any decisions. So, Eric, would you like to join us, please, and sit in the car? And we'll move off round to the front of the vehicle. We'd ask the assistant, Eric, to switch on the lights, please. We'd check the condition and operation of all the legal required lighting at the front, not forgetting that they need to be tapped, to see if they flicker and check for security. Having checked the headlights, we would then, using the appropriate headlamp aim equipment, which firstly we've accurately aligned to the vehicle's centre line, at the correct distance, with of course an assistant sat in the car, we'd carry out the checks of headlamps aim, headlamp aim. We're going to set off the, around the car now in a clockwise direction. So putting the beam tester away, we're going to move over to this corner here, and carry out a check of the operation of the front shock absorber. Be careful not to damage body panels. When we're happy with the shock absorber, step back and look for sharp edges and damage. Looking down now at the tyre, find out the size and type on the tyre. But the tyre condition I'll do later when I have a much better view. With a Class 7 vehicle, the tyre sidewall needs to be checked for the load and speed rating and compare your findings with the tables in the manual. Stepping back again, moving towards my left, we'll check the security of the side repeater. Leaning over, we'll check the security and the condition of the wiper blade. 
stepping back and looking, moving left again, the security of the wing mirror. We're happy with the wing mirror, look at the door for sharp edges and damage, opening the door, and if you just swing your feet to one side, please, Eric, we'd usually need a light source, because it's usually dark here, and we'd examine all testable items underneath the dashboard area. Having done that, we would move along the inner sill, squeezing firmly by finger and thumb pressure. Now, it's particularly important in this prescribed area here where the seat belt mounting occurs. Checking, of course, the seat belt webbing and material. Again, looking for sharp edges and damage and moving left, we'd go into the back of the car and check the testable items here, which a seat back is held in the upright position, all the seat belt checks, and then squeezing the inner sill for the prescribed areas. Looking for sharp edges and damage, size and type again on the tyre, assessing the action of this rear shock absorber. Now moving across the back of the car, we're going to check the rear lights. Eric, please the lights. Not forgetting to tap. Tap for flickering and check for security. We need to also to check a thing called interaction. Does any circuit affect the action of another circuit? The boot, please, Eric. Now, checks inside the boot consist of fuel system components where these can be seen, seat belt, rear seat belt anchor points, and rear suspension attachment areas of the body shell. Moving round this side of the vehicle, we'd repeat the rear shock absorber, look for sharp edges and damage, the fuel cap please Eric, and looking into the fuel cap area, where we'd check the seal and the net condition. And then we'd progressively work down the near side of the car, repeating all the checks that we did on the offside. And finally, Sean, coming back around to the front of the vehicle, we're going to carry out the underbonnet checks. The catch, please, Eric. Now, under here, as with the rest of the car, what's needed really is a system. We're systematically going to pick up a point in here and sweep around there. Now, obviously, a light source is essential and it may well be that the car will require the use of the corrosion assessment tool. So, from this point in here, we're going to sweep around, looking from down in this area here, searching the car's body shell for, in particular, the prescribed areas for any signs of excessive corrosion. There are none on this vehicle. We're moving across, and we're looking now at all the bulkhead area and the corrosion around here, round there, and down into the area around here. Essential to have your assistant because we'll need the engine running. OK, Eric, make sure you're out of gear and start the engine, please. Now, Sean, with the engine running, there's several things we can check. Is the exhaust system unnecessarily noisy from, say, the exhaust manifold? Are there fuel system leaks? All the fuel system on view here. And also with the engine running, we can assess all the brake system components under full servo pressure. So we'd look at the items. OK, Eric, foot brake hard on. And off. Foot brake hard on. And off. Testing items under pressure. One last job that we'd save to the end is rock the steering. Now, for that, the engine would need to be running if there was power steering. And so, rock the steering, please, Eric. We'd need a light source to look at any tested items. That completes the underbonnet inspection. The next thing we're going to do is move forward onto the ramp. And for that, we have to retain the services of the assistant, and we'll keep him until we've completed the underside inspection. The next part is the under-vehicle examination. This would start with rock the steering. Now, for that particular test, it's important that the car's not sat on the turn plate. We don't want to remove the load from the steering joint. Also for that, the engine should be running. Now, with that engine running, the best practice is to get all the checks out of the way that require the engine to be run. And that would be the brake, servo-assisted brake pressure checks and checking the front flexible hoses for ballooning under pressure. 
do the two front hoses, move down to the back axle and there you'll find another one or two flexible hoses. Check those. Remember, all brake hoses and pipes need to be checked under full pressure. If there's a mechanical load sensing valve, we might check that now to see that it moves. Walking back down the vehicle, checking the exhaust system for noise and leaks. When we come back to the front, we can now ask the assistant to switch the engine off and we shouldn't need it again. This extra little procedure we've just talked about is not exactly what's shown in the manual, but the purpose of it is to enable the checks that are necessary with the engine running to be completed as quickly as possible so that the engine can be shut down and this will minimise pollution. OK, Eric, switch off the engine. Just as with the vehicle on its wheels, there is a set inspection route underside as well. In the manual's suggested routine under the vehicle, we see a view from above. This shows a start point by the offside front wheel. Work forward from here and across the front of the vehicle and then back along an imaginary line between the front wheel centres. Then continue down the offside to the rear, checking as you go. Move across and then return down the vehicle to the near side front wheel. Once again, let's look at the routine in more detail. The circuit actually starts ahead of what we'll call the front axle. We refer to it as the front axle, it will be in line in this vehicle with the drive shaft. So standing ahead of the front axle and looking in at the offside front wheel, the tester would now systematically search for defects in that area there, coming back along the suspension, sweeping round the front of the vehicle, back down the inspection here and into the back of that wheel there. When he's completed that search, he steps behind the front axle going to the same wheel, moving into the back of this wheel, again, he's visually inspecting and looking for defects. This is all a visual inspection. The inspection comes out along the suspension, bringing in prescribed areas. We've now come into body mountings. He would now progressively move down the vehicle to a point about here where he would break away from the main circuit and shout to the assistant to operate the parking brake from the nearest place that we can observe it. OK, Eric, operate the parking brake on and off. So now, having done the handbrake, we'll return to the main circuit. Along here, prescribed area suspension mounting, rubber bushes, all the visible components around the back of the vehicle, sweeping around the back progressively and methodically, searching all the time for visual defects. Along here, suspension components, body components, brake pipes and so on, back up along here. Now step outside the vehicle here and our inspection of the outer sill area. Stepping back inside, completing the circuit along this side and ending up at the inside of the near side front wheel. And you'll find that that is the circuit given in the tester's manual. That's completed our methodical search of the underside of the vehicle. We're now ready to go into what we call the jacking routine. We're going to jack the front of the vehicle first and then the back. Now when we jack the front of the vehicle, it's important to have identified which suspension type you have because the manual shows us all the different suspension types and the appropriate jacking position. Now this particular vehicle is equipped with what we call McPherson strut suspension and so it's critical that we jack on the body and let the suspension fully hang. We've jacked the vehicle up and brought it back down to a comfortable working height. We're going to move on to the next stage now, which involves us carrying out an examination inside the wheel arch area. So, Henrik, what's this used for? Right, Sean, we call this the heel bar. And this is used by placing it underneath the front wheel and levering upwards. Now that's done on every car, but what we're actually looking for as we lever upwards will differ from suspension type to suspension type, and all the different items are listed clearly in the manual. For this particular car, what we would be looking at would be solely the attachment of the upper McPherson strut to the inner wing. After that, we'll lower the vehicle onto the turn plates and carry out the lock-to-lock -lock checks.
and again brake hoses for stretching, twisting and fouling and tyres for catching on suspension and bodywork. Straight ahead position please Eric. Right now you've got Eric out of the car, what are you going to use him for? Eric, would you step in here? What we're going to do is complete the front suspension checks. Grasping the wheel firmly at the 12 o'clock position at the top, rock it vigorously in and out, whilst I inspect the condition and wear on the strut inside. OK, Eric, vigorously in and out. And stop. When I'm happy with the condition of the strut, I'll ask Eric to change his grip to the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. And again, the vigorous shaking action is in and out until we get it to slide on the plate. Well, during that check, I'm behind here checking the lower suspension ball joint and the track control arm in the bushes. OK, give it a vigorous rock, please, Eric. The ball joint. And across to the bush. And that one's fine. Thanks very much. We've moved to the rear of the vehicle now, Sean. We've correctly jacked it. Now, the manual asks us to jack wherever possible under the body, letting the wheel hang free, whatever the suspension type. This will give us a much better view when we sweep around here, testing all the items that come into view. The next part of the test is the brake test. We're going to use a roller brake tester. There are full instructions in the tester's manual for the correct use of a plate brake tester. Also listed in the manual, there are a list of vehicles which should not be roller brake tested. These vehicles would need to be tested on the road using a decelerometer. So back to the roller brake test. First of all, we've got to align the car centrally in the rollers. Handbrake off, start both rollers together, let the car centralise itself in the roller set. Stop the rollers and firmly apply the parking brake. Starting the near side roller, take the brake reading slowly through to a maximum value and with any modern servo assisted brake car we're going to achieve a wheel lock. Write down the value at which the wheel, the maximum value it reached and whether it locked. Repeat that for the offside wheel, slowly through to a maximum reading and whether the wheel locked. When we've got both of the front wheel readings recorded and whether they're locked, we're now going to go into what we call the balance test. And for that, we're going to start both of the front wheels at the same time. Before we press the brake pedal, the first thing to do is to look for any bind on the clocks. There are none, and so you go through now. Slowly observe how the readings rise as a matched pair. Take the readings as high as possible but do not allow the wheels to lock. When we're happy with the balance, and this one's clearly good, watch the brake as you slowly release it to see that the release is a pair. When we finish the front wheels, we're going to move the car forward onto the rear wheel brake test. Right, we've moved forward now onto the rear wheels, keeping the car alignment straight. We'll start the near side roller and take the brake reading through to its maximum. Now, as expected here, it didn't lock and that's due to the action of a load limiting valve, normally anyway. Release the brake, stop the wheel and record the maximum value. Repeat that on the other side and again, foot brake through to the maximum reading. Again, no lock, record that reading, release the brake, stop the roller. Now, start them as a pair and firstly, check for excessive bind. There's no bind there. Take both brake rollers as a rolling pair through to a maximum reading, not letting them lock, of course. Don't forget to watch them as you release the brake pedal, come slowly back down again, and they're behaving fine. Now, this time, there are no imbalance requirements on the rear. It's simply up to the tester himself to decide if he has found a serious braking defect. Now onto the handbrake, start the near side again, slowly apply the handbrake through to its maximum, and sure enough this time the brake has actually locked. Release it, start the other side, and slowly and firmly apply the handbrake. There it is, a locked wheel reading, record that. 
and stop the rollers. That completes the rear brake test. Having completed the brake test and gathered all the brake figures and information, we now need to do a brake efficiency calculation. Now the vehicle that we tested is a class 4 vehicle and so for that we would need to take the vehicle's wall chart weight from the wall chart and perform a calculation of efficiency. It can be done very simply on a device like this or by using the formulas in the manual you would simply divide the wall chart weight into the total brake effort and arrive at a brake efficiency. There are possible problem areas. There are many vehicles that are not on this chart. Take, for example, a motor caravan. Now, that is a class four vehicle. Won't be found on the wall chart weight. And what we should ask that owner for, ideally, is for a Weybridge ticket. Now, that Weybridge ticket will be used to perform the calculation. It has an additional benefit. On viewing the Weybridge ticket with such like as a motorhome, you would then know whether you were likely to overload your equipment. Remember we said we hadn't to overload the jack. Moving on now to another issue, and that is where, during the brake test, if more than half of the wheels in any system were to have locked, then you would not need to perform a calculation for that system. And that holds good for both the service brake, where that would have to be three or four locked wheels, or the case of a handbrake, where that would have to be both of the wheels locking. Although this means the vehicle has passed the braking efficiency test, it still might fail for other performance defects, like imbalance. And now quickly class sevens. The big difference with class seven brake testing is that you do not use a wall chart weight. The calculation is performed using the vehicle's design gross weight. And that design gross weight was found on the VIN plate on the vehicle. And now to emission testing. Emission testing would either be done early on in the test or now at the end, depending on the suitability of engine temperature. Now emission testing should be conducted in a well-ventilated atmosphere or, alternatively, by using suitable exhaust extraction equipment, like this. Now the full procedure on how to carry out the emissions test and use the equipment is fully covered in another video in this series. So Henrik, should a tester rigidly stick to all this? No, not necessarily, Sean. The system that I've shown you is the best system. It's the system we've used for years. It works and works well. However, if a tester has a system he's happy with, and importantly, it does not allow him to miss a testable item, then that would be OK. And finally, Sean, the test is not complete without the paperwork. If the car had passed, we would make out a VT20 test certificate. If the car had failed, a VT30 failure certificate. Attached to either of those would be a copy of our inspection checklist. And then the whole thing is entered into the VT12 register. And that brings the test to the end. Air transport relies on set inspection routines and procedures. It is a culture that works so well that the safety of flying can be taken for granted. People demand road safety, and that too depends on setting standards. The MOT test is a standard setting cornerstone in making sure our roads are safer for everyone. The vehicle inspectorate's role is to ensure that vehicles, when used on the road, are roadworthy and they meet environmental standards. We are also interested in supporting, helping the MOT scheme and the testers to ensure that they test vehicles to the correct standard. MOT Matters is a series covering many issues that concern authorised examiners and nominated testers. An address for more details and where to order further titles is on the back of your video case.